Hi, welcome to our podcast, Aging Gracefully with Julie Roca. How many of you have seen the video uh, of a lady who has late stages of dementia? Her name is Marta Gonzalez, and Swan Lake comes on and it's pi being piped into her ears, and she looks tired in the beginning. But just a couple of minutes into the song, uh, as the song begins to build and you can hear the orchestra build up, this lady comes alive. And it is a truly a beautiful scene to watch her kind of dancing in her wheelchair. And that that video is so impactful. I brought my friend, Dr. Aaron Culverson, in today to have a discussion about that very thing. So stick around and watch to the end. Uh, Dr. Aaron Culverson is a doctor of philosophy from the University of Florida in ethnomusicology with partnering research in neuropsychology. So a very interesting marriage there of those two. Welcome, mm -hmm. Dr. Culverson. Thank you very much, Julie. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, this, this passion that you have for bringing music to the dementia brain. This did not come just from uh, you going to school and saying, oh, what would I, what would I like to do with my life? This mm. came from a more personal place. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your background and your story. Sure. So thanks very much for having me today. Oh, you're um, welcome. And I, I'd like to share, first of all, that, that Julie and I play music together. And yes. I, that's a really important detail is uh, music is part of my life. Music is part of our lives. Yep. And music is part of other people's lives. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a really important part of this whole story uh, is that music's always been a central aspect of who I am as an individual and how I connect with others. Yeah. One of those people was my dad. Yeah. Um, uh, he passed away in 2016 from a rather rare uh, form of dementia called frontotemporal dementia. Um, and how old were you when you started seeing kind of signs of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, it, so it, was a, it was an interesting process. Um, our family noticed that he was going through some sort of changes symptomatically uh, probably four or so years before he passed away. Okay. Um, maybe even beyond, maybe, excuse me, probably even before that. So part of this story is that um, my mom and I lived in Nairobi, Kenya for, yes. for many years um, between the years of 2012 to 2014. And my father came across and joined us there. And before he came across is when my mom really started to notice that behaviorally, he was just a mm -hmm. different person. Mm -hmm. um, he would make decisions that were really strange. He would say things that were really strange. And in general, he was not who he was before he started right. to have this disease process. Um, so <clears throat> when, when we came back to the United States, it's actually a funny little aside uh, associated with his whole experience and our, ours as a family. Um, he, uh, he, he, he came back because we challenged him to be diagnosed. Uh, <laughs> I remember you telling me that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, for, for him, um, he was like, no, there's nothing wrong with me. You know, and we see that all the time you know, in the dementia world. People right. will say, there's nothing wrong with me. Yeah. I don't need to see a doctor. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. sure there's a bunch of people that can resonate with that yes, reality, yeah. certainly as caregivers, um, that that uh, so challenging him to be like, well, prove us wrong um, <laughs> was a was a really, really mo um, important moment for my brother and I in particular. And my dad agreed to it. He was like, OK, yeah, I'll go to the doctor. I'll see what's going on. You know, and of course, he was diagnosed with this disease. And the doctor, this was a, another really important moment, was just in tears. Mm -hmm. uh, so frontotemporal dementia is really different than Alzheimer's disease. Yes. Is really different yeah. than paracerebral palsy is really different than mm -hmm. Parkinson's is really different. Maybe even you can say that like Lou Gehrig somehow associates in terms of daily functioning being reduced. Right. Yeah. Um, so frontotemporal, I like to think about it in terms of a quick statement as you lose your ability to understand consequences. Yeah. Um, you know? Um, I think someone with that diagnosis that everyone can resonate with is Bruce Willis. Doesn't he have the Good same? Example. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a great example. Yeah. And I don't know what's going on with his particular situation. Right. I'm sure Everybody's there's all kinds of, mm -hmm. you know. But so my dad um, had this behavioral variant form of the disease. And 
just totally, his personality totally changed. His ability to understand what was going on socially totally changed. And when we came back to the United States, um, he had, uh, my, my parents had divorced. Yeah. Okay. Um, he had gotten remarried uh, to a lady from Kenya. Um, we had to navigate all the divorce situation with her once he passed away, um, oh, which wow. was just, it was like a two year process and it was, it was mm. just a really big pain in the butt. Um, so undergirding all of this kind of chaos, if you will, f- yeah. familially and whatever, was his uh, um, ability to still connect with the Dire Straits and the Rolling Stones. Yeah, right. Music that for him was childhood memories and upbringing memories and, and things that also mm-hmm. had a lot of meaning for my brother and I. Right. Um, so I, I cared for my dad here in Gainesville. And my brother cared for him up in uh, Oak Ridge, Tennessee for, for some months before we had to put him into a long-term care facility because we couldn't deal mm-hmm. with it. And I just, I'll never forget seeing him on the porch listening to music and drawing or painting or writing a letter to his Kenyan wife at that time or something that uh, facilitated identity yeah. and facilitated a way to maintain connection to his outside surroundings, particularly with others mm-hmm. and memories that had such a value for him. So yeah. I think music music is one of these tools, if you will, that can facilitate those memories. It can facilitate those connections. Absolutely. And and that's maybe one of the reasons why it's so valuable to understand what's going on mm-hmm. with, with that whole situation. Yeah. You and I, you spoke of your father being in a long-term care um, community here in Gainesville. Um, so you and I have commonality there because Ann Parton was the woman who was engaging with your father that mm. was there. And when I first got into the healthcare community, though I had a little bit of background in teaching school and in working with seniors beforehand as a teenager, I really didn't have a lot of healthcare experience. Mm. So Ann Parton um, had given to our community for many, many years in this capacity and learning to engage with mm. the dementia brain. Mm. And so she gave me a crash course in about six months of how to do this best. And it was 80% music. Mm-hmm. So she was very excited when mm-hmm. I mentioned your name and uh, she knew exactly who you were. She was excited mm-hmm. to hear about your work. Yeah. So now yeah. what are you kind of doing now? Yeah, so so thanks so much for for sharing about you know my my academic background and, and the academic yeah. areas that I'm that I'm part of. Um, so just really quickly, ethnomusicology is in a nutshell the cultural anthropology of music, mm-hmm. and that uh, thought process really hadn't been associated with the dementia space until quite recently. Yeah. Um, even not even really until the 21st century, right? Only in the past 20 years or so. Right. There's a couple of examples of folks who have really gone down that path, and I'm actually in touch with them regularly because they also are very interested in some of the science that's associated with what's going on with music in the brain, um, particularly the healthcare side. Yeah. Um, So one of the things that I have found in my research is that you know, the brain is separated into all these different areas without going super scientific here. Um, And on one side of the brain, you have things that are healthy memories, good memories. On the other side of the brain, like you might even be storing bad language Mm. and things like that. And so you can, if you lose parts of your brain, you may still retain, you know, the bad language Mm -hmm. part of your brain. Mm -hmm. Um, But music, from what I see... Mm -hmm is lodged everywhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I have seen people, again, I am not a doctor, I am not a scientist, but I have seen people personally that have been nonverbal. And when you play, for example, take me out to the ball game Mm -hmm. or Amazing Grace, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden they can sing again. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. it is, it's giving me goosebumps. It's truly great. Mm -hmm. And we had one, Mm -hmm. we had another podcast in here and it's not just the music. Sometimes it's the the movement, right? Yeah, exactly. We had another podcast in which she tells a story about the movement with her son in a dance. Yeah. She got a moment to actually see him as her son again, and that was beautiful. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So do you any, do anything with the mu- movement and the music? And tell yeah. us a little bit about your studies and what you've done. Sure. So, um, so... For my dissertation, right, this is where I got this doctor of philosophy degree, uh, 
I did not work with folks with dementia. I worked with healthy okay. aging people. Um, one of the reasons is that it's feasibility, right? You mm-hmm. can accomplish a study uh, with folks who are normal functioning, quote right. unquote, yeah, yeah. much, much easier than, than folks who are constantly going through a disease process. And I learned that from my, from my mentors and advisors. Initially, I was going to do stuff with people with Alzheimer's disease as an example. But then they were like, no, you're not going to graduate. <laughs> so, so um, but taking a step back, um, besides the story that I've just shared about my dad, um, uh, following from that period of time, I received a fellowship to look at relationships between music and dementia. And yeah. that, that fellowship uh, has transformed my career. Yeah. Um, I'm now on the path to maintain study of these relationships between music and the brain and the dementia space uh, because we got a paper published and in the academic world, publishing papers is a really big deal. Um, and that paper talks about uh, this, I think, very much what you're saying about the different places in the brain that music is stored. Oh, I'm so um, excited you're going to study this. You know. So excited. I mean, I'm sad I, that we're going to lose you. You're going sure. across the country, but. Right. It's a, yeah. So, so. <laughs> I'm moving to San Francisco. I'm going to keep uh, doing this kind of work with with ethnomusicology and neuropsychology, uh, particularly to study rhythm in music. Yes. And um, how that associates with cognition mm-hmm. in, in the brain. Um, cognition is like functioning, right? Yeah. How we think, yeah. how we act, decisions, planning. These, these kinds of things are associated with cognition. And wow, you are the person to study this because yeah. you spent those years in Kenya. Mm-hmm. Um, so talk about going to a place where music is very rich Ugh. and the rhythm is so much a part of yeah. everything for them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think this is going to be great mm-hmm. for you. So Yeah. Well, you know, and that's, that's a, that's a, that's a um, there's a lot there. Uh, in terms of just like the history of the music of, mm-hmm. of the continent, right? Yeah. Africa. Yeah. Um, and Kenya's one spot, and like there's a lot of cultural diversity and so many different types of music, so many different traditions, and a lot of history with the, the Arabs and the English and all these kinds of things. Um, rich, rich history. Yes. And really got me into the non Western musics, you know? Yeah. Those yeah, kinds I of bet spaces. it did. I bet so. Yeah. So are there tips and tricks that you know? I know you're still studying so much. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that our listeners can sit in their living room Mm -hmm. and kind of help their loved ones to connect or can connect with their loved ones? Yeah. So I would say that the most accessible path for that Mm -hmm. is if you're okay using websites, which I know can be challenging for some folks, uh, there's a website called Music and Memory. Mm -hmm. And it's just an absolutely uh, amazing resource that provides a step-by-step instruction process for how to understand what music your loved one connects with most, what has the most meaning. And so uh, um, creating a playlist for your loved one is a really important step. Mm -hmm. But you first have to think about what kind of music means something to your loved one. Yeah, like, for um, example, Marta Gonzalez, the mm-hmm. dancer that I was referring to in the beginning. Great example. She may not have reacted at all to um, Take Me Out to the Ball Game mm-hmm. or to Led Zeppelin mm-hmm. or anything like that. But, man, that Swan, Swan Lake, Lake music, yeah. she just comes yeah. alive. Yeah. I think so. I, I, wanted, I wanted to emphasize, too, like, for me, when I first saw that video, her eyes... Uh, she's been trained so well in the art of ballet mm-hmm. that like the movement of her face and like how she directs her attention and yes. so on associates with like when she moves in certain ways with her hands. Yes. And it was all programmed and planned about what was occurring with the music. Yeah. Very much speaks to the storage of memory in the mind for music and how it then associates with movement. Mm-hmm. But, like, it was so precise. It was. And it was so funny because at the end of the video, if you watch, there's there's one video that has a little bit more to it. And the caregiver is continuing to talk to her. She sits there and critiques herself. <laughs> she tells him, like, oh, I should have done this. or And it was great. It was hilarious. Um, Before that, she's just kind of. She was almost yeah. almost lifeless, mm-hmm. right? She was breathing, but and then there was nothing going on. She talks to the caregiver about. About her performance, she did. Which I mean, then what's going on upstairs in that situation is like magic. Yeah, it that is. You're lifeless, and now you're analyzing yourself. Yes. So very important to find that genre that mm-hmm. really kind of helps to unlock those doors. 
So, Huge. you know, with my classical and him, him background, mm-hmm. for me, it's going to be the, the hymns mm-hmm. and some classical music. Mm-hmm. Um, for uh, some other people that I'm realizing have dementia now, mm-hmm. uh, sometimes it's the 1970s that's unlocking them and figuring out, you know, what era is it, what genre mm-hmm. makes all the difference in the world. Absolutely. Uh, karaoke is something that some people cool. really enjoy. Yeah. And I find that um, the dementia brain sometimes has a really hard time with like the standard karaoke. Mm-hmm. Have you ever seen the sing-alongs with C- Susie Q? Uh, not not in person. I have not. Okay. Well, so for you, yeah, yeah. Um, down the road, yeah. this is a karaoke channel that oh. this lady has literally um, decades of music compiled. Mm. And I really like them because you'll only see one short line Mm -hmm. of large print words Mm -hmm. on the screen. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple. Like she doesn't go over the top with orchestration and Mm -hmm. all that. It's like piano and maybe rhythm. Oh, beautiful. And the dementia brain, I find, can follow along Mm -hmm. because it's simpler. It's a little bit simpler. Interesting. Do you have any other tips for people? Well, so... I mean, maybe that's a case-by-case basis. Mm -hmm. I think this is an important detail. But so I say that just because in terms of the Marta Gonzalez example, right, that was a fully orchestrated uh, recording. Yes, it was. Right? The symphony is playing and she's doing her thing. So it's interesting to consider that maybe simplicity is important for some individuals, which considering as as a tip, this is a really important detail for those who are trying to provide music in home Mm-hmm. to their loved one who might not have supervision of, of an individual who's been trained, you can trigger people. And if you put them down a path that ca- that increases agitation or increases anxiety or depression That's or something like that. That's a great point, yeah. Then you're not going in the right direction. No. Um, so <laughs> so true. music can be an amazing resource for joy and, you know, reflection and memory and, and connection and these things. Or... It can go down yes. a path of depression uh, you know, and anxiety, s- things that are not helpful. So I think that's a you mentioned a tip. This is a really important thing to think about is like when you expose, especially if they're in later disease states and they don't have a really good self-control mechanism at that time, they might turn into somebody that you don't want to interact with all of a sudden. So mm-hmm. it's if you do decide those caregivers who are out there to do this kind of a practice, make sure that you're doing it in a way that is intentional. Yeah, um, that's, okay. that's, that's a really important detail. So one of the things that we discovered, you know, in my time with Ann Parton in the communities um, is that if we played music at mm-hmm. certain times of the day, for example, we would play music at meals. Mm-hmm. Um, and intentionally, we yeah. didn't play music that you would sing along to because you're trying to eat, <laughs> right? Yeah, so we don't want them to break into <laughs> song <laughs> while they're already struggling to, <laughs> to swallow and do the things that we okay. kind of take for granted every day. Um, but we did find that if, for example, playing simple jazz music in the background, Mm -hmm. it makes you feel like you're in a restaurant, Mm -hmm. in a dining area. Mm -hmm. This is something that's pleasant. This is something that we can, Mm -hmm. um, sit down and congregate together like you would on a day that you were going out to lunch or going out to dinner with your family. So those kinds of things are helpful, Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but I, I do think you're right. Finding out what kind of music triggers in the right way is yeah. so important. Right. This this we, The way that you just framed that, too, of like the jazz music in the background can remind of a restaurant or an, or an mm-hmm. atmosphere. I think that kind of an association is a way in which music has such power. Yeah. Um, that's the memory piece, right? Yeah. That when, yeah. when we link it in, you mentioned the 1970s. The certain song that somebody might hear might then remind them of uh, very late stage civil rights movement issues. Obviously, that was more in the '60s, but '70s obviously it still carry on today. But yes, okay, you're totally right about that. You know what yep. I mean? Like the, the mm-hmm. ways in which music are used in certain moments and in certain times and so on ha- can provide that meaning that can have you know an effect upon somebody's mood. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a really it, it's a it's a balancing act to use music in certain ways at certain times to then lead to a certain conclusion. 
Yeah. Um, and I think that's very much where the caregiver can can spend some time to educate themselves yep. about about what 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 really power the music has. Yeah, yeah. So um, in my everyday world, I do placements in assisted livings, and one of the things that I think is so key is really paying attention to that life enrichment mm -hmm. um, component. There, do they play music? Uh, are they playing music at meal times to bring mm -hmm. up? Um, happy thoughts of dining and mm -hmm. things that want to motivate in good directions. So I think that that's one of the key elements that I I point out to people is, hey, what kind of entertainment are they bringing in? Yeah. What, who are the entertainers they have? Are they playing music in the community? Because mm -hmm. it's important. Mm -hmm. It's so mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, 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 this, for me, this is my passion of, of pursuing this work. I mean, you guys see the violin. Maybe you don't see the violin, but there's a violin here. Um, I'll be playing some <laughs> violin later. Uh, um, you know, it, it's I, I mentioned in the beginning and con our connection, right? We connected through music. Through music, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're having this conversation here. We have mutual uh, acquaintances and colleagues and so on through music. Right. It's part of being a human being. Yeah. And uh, that direction piece, how you can, you know, use the music in certain ways for emotional connection and memory and so on. These are things that we're wired for. We are. You know, even yeah. though dementia can strip all the stuff that it does to so many people for connection and so on, music isn't lost. Yep. And and, and, and what that can then do for, for, for other ways of moving forward. Even to so the very, powerful. Even to the very end stages, music is not completely lost. It's not so lost. So it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, you are going to do something really awesome. I really... I volunteer my life away with the Alzheimer's Association, so I think I'm so much in that world that it's probably in every single podcast I have. Mm -hmm. But you are actually doing something really neat and exciting. You have a program coming up, right? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple different ones. Um, so I was accepted to AAIC, the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, mm -hmm. to present a poster of, of some of my academic work. And um, one of your colleagues, I believe, Stephanie Ward Wardlow Thompson, um, who works with Alzheimer's Association in North Central Florida, asked me to give some sort of a presentation similar yeah. to what we're doing here today, I think. Yes. Um, but in the form of a, kind of a webinar. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll have like a PowerPoint and I'll, I'll give some tips and tricks and so on. Okay. Um, and very much dive more so into those websites. I mentioned music and memory. There's a few others that I'm also going to talk about. Oh, that's exciting. And offer some navigation to to help folks see what's on the websites, how they can get to them, how they can use those resources. And also, it's like there's several. So if you don't like this one, you can try that one. If you don't like that mm -hmm. one, you can try that one. There's 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 ways to kind of you know um, shop around if you okay. will. Okay, gotcha. Um, and it's a big topic right now, mu Huge. music and, and the treatment of of symptoms yeah. in, in particular. So um, when is that? Is that in August? Yes, I believe okay. the date is August 16th. I think that's right. And I think um, this podcast should be out before then, so I may put the link in um, in the notes so that people can go Very and good. register. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be nice. Yeah, because I think that's going to be a really great program. Yeah, should be helpful. Yeah. So one of the things that we wanted to do today, your dad had a song that was impactful in his life, mm -hmm. and you did bring your violin. I did, yeah. <laughs> and we're gonna we're gonna hear it. Yeah, yeah. So this is um, you might recognize this melody actually. It's a it's a tune that was used in uh, <laughs> it's kind of somber. Um, the Civil War uh, documentary by Ken Burns. Um, this is called A Shokin Farewell. It's written by Jay Unger. Um, and it's just a really famous fiddle tune, made famous, arguably, by that documentary film. And I don't know why, but my dad just really meant something to him. So oh, I'll, I'll share so that with everybody. What was your dad's name? Pete Culverson. So in honor of Pete Culverson, yeah, you are going to play this song for him. Yeah, this is this tune.
rendition of. Oh, that is beautiful. I do recognize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's something about that melody. It's haunting. It is haunting, but it's beautiful. Yeah. I can understand why he liked it. Well, Dr. Aaron Culverson, (laughs) my friend, thank you for coming. Very welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Julie. I am excited to watch all the things that you will do. I appreciate it. Thanks.